Four zero Juliet Golf. You just keep flying that airplane all the way through. You'll be just fine. Tell my family I love them. Those would be the pilot's last heartbreaking words. And I specifically chose not to share that portion of the audio out of respect for his family. And in today's video, we're gonna take a look at exactly what went wrong on this flight that led to this unfortunate tragedy and discuss the key lessons. If you don't know me, I'm Hoover, and I want to start this pilot debrief by saying that every video that I make is done so knowing that the pilot or their family may end up seeing it. And that's why this one was so tough, because I film every debrief as if they're in the room with me. And this incident happened about a year ago. The aircraft is a 1969 Piper PA-32, also known as a Piper Cherokee 6. And its most recent annual inspection was on October 4th. And the pilot was flying it on October 18th from the maintenance facility at the Springfield Robertson County Airport, just northwest of Nashville, down to the Fayetteville Municipal Airport in order to get an avionics repair done that I'm gonna talk more about later in this video. Now let's listen to the audio to see how this all started. Number 600, Juliet Golf, proceed on course. Sir, I have to declare emergency, my engine's running rough. Number 600, Juliet Golf, you understand you're declaring an emergency due to a rough running engine? Armadale 600, Juliet Golf. Number 0, Juliet Golf, Roger. Uh, nearest airport, would you like to turn around and go to uh, John Toon or Murfreesboro or Smyrna? You say it. Johnson, 600 Juliet Golf. Over zero Juliet Golf, turn right, right turn, heading of uh, 350. 350, 600 Juliet Golf. Anytime you have an emergency, you want to aviate, navigate, then communicate. And he does a really great job of maintaining aircraft control with a rough engine, and he doesn't waste any time declaring the emergency. Now the navigate and the communicate part kind of blend together, and that's fine because in this situation, you might have your hands full trying to figure out what's wrong with the engine. So just declare the emergency, and don't be afraid to ask the controller where the closest airport is. But in this case, the controller also does a great job because he doesn't even wait for the pilot to ask. He immediately gives him three options for where to go. He's got John Toon, Murfreesboro to the east, or Smyrna. So he decides to go to John Toon, and then listen to what the controller says next. For zero Juliet Golf, you just let me know if there's anything, you, altitudes or your discretion. For zero Juliet Golf, Nashville BNA is also a uh, viable option. It's two miles closer to you if you want that. Uh, let's do BNA, please. Number zero, Juliet Golf, Roger, turn right, right turn, heading of zero, three, zero. Zero, three, zero. November zero, Juliet Golf, just uh, check your mixture uh, settings for me and uh, all that stuff. First of all, the controller is talking very calmly on the radio and trying to be reassuring, just letting the pilot know that whatever he needs, they're going to help him out. And he tells him that altitude is his discretion. So that means he can climb or descend without asking permission, knowing that air traffic control is going to move everyone else out of his way. Second, now that the controller has had a few seconds to analyze the situation, he's able to tell him that the Nashville airport is actually two miles closer, so he decides to go there. And I think this is another great decision because you never want to pass up a good runway, especially one at a major airport where you're going to have a lot more resources. Now the third thing the controller said was to check your mixture settings and all that stuff. And I know some of you might disagree with the controller interjecting here because the controller doesn't know what the problem is. However, I think this is just fine because he doesn't get too far into the weeds asking what's wrong with the engine or anything else. And he's just throwing out a simple reminder to run the checklist. And the first step in the checklist is to make sure your fuel selector is switched to a tank containing fuel because the handbook will tell you that complete engine power loss is usually caused by fuel flow interruption, basically running out of fuel due to improper fuel management. However, the real reason for the crash is related to an engine problem that I'm going to explain in a minute. Number zero, Juliet Golf, you can plan a visual approach to runway two left in Nashville. You're on a good heading right now. Two left, Nashville. Can you get me filled out for me, please? November zero, Juliet Golf. If you want the localizer, I've got the frequency for you if you want it. Negative. I just do a visual. Roger. November zero, Juliet Golf. Are you able to hold altitude? Uh, presently affirmed. Yes. Roger. The controller has him set up to fly the visual approach to runway two left, but the reason he offers him the localizer is because a pilot can use that localizer signal to essentially align themselves with the runway. And that's a good method to use as a backup to fly in a visual approach 
because it's gonna allow you to cross-reference your instruments to make sure you're lined up on the right runway. And I know there's been a lot of pilots that think they have the runway in sight, but they're actually lined up on a different runway, or sometimes they're even lined up on the wrong airport. And the flight data shows that he's descending right now, but there's a little bit of a lag because he's actually leveled off at 4,800 feet and holding about 110 knots. And by the way, you can see that this is ground speed. And because we don't know the winds at his altitude and his location, it's tough to know what his exact indicated airspeed is, but the last step in the checklist says that you should trim for 87 knots. And at this point, looking at the aerial imagery he's got the golf course out in front of him the interstate over to the left and you can see the airport off in the distance but it's obviously a lot of residential area between without too many fields or places to land but let's see what happens next over zero juliet golf uh, the nashville airport is at your 11 o'clock approximately 1 1 11 miles report in sight there it is in sight over zero juliet golf roger proceed straight in runway two left in November zero Juliet Golf, if you get a moment, please let me know how many people you have on board the aircraft and how much fuel you have on board the aircraft. One, one person on the board in four hours of fuel. Correct. Two and a half hours of fuel. November zero Juliet Golf, Roger. Thank you. You might have noticed that he started descending. Now the elevation at Nashville is 600 feet and he asked about that earlier and that's so he can plan for the approach. And if we look at the localizer to runway two left, you can see that about 10 and a half miles from the runway, you might normally be at 4,000 feet. So because he's 11 miles from the field and at 4,500 feet, either he's starting a shallow descent to get ready to land or the engine problem is getting worse and he's starting to lose altitude. We don't know, so I'm not suggesting that he did anything wrong here by starting this descent. But as pilots, if you find yourself in a situation like this, as long as the engine power allows you to maintain altitude and airspeed, then you might consider staying level just a little bit longer to try and preserve what altitude you have just in case the engine quits on you. And again, I'm not suggesting that this pilot made a mistake. I'm just trying to point out some things that you might want to think about before you go fly again. Approach just to confirm, I'm headed towards Nashville, not to Marta, correct? November zero, Juliet Golf Affirmative. The Nashville airport is at your 11 o'clock, it's 12 to 11 o'clock and approximately one zero miles. You're looking for runway two left. Two left, it's Golf. Remember what I said earlier about using your instruments to back you up? Now maybe the avionics issue that he needed fixed prevented him from tuning in the localizer. Either way, he does a great job of just confirming that the airport he's lined up on is Nashville and not Smyrna. He's using the controller as much as he needs to, but unfortunately he doesn't know that his engine is about to fail, and here's what the NTSB preliminary report said about that. When examining the post-crash wreckage, attempts to rotate the propeller were unsuccessful. The rear-mounted engine accessories were removed, and the crankshaft still couldn't be rotated by hand. The oil suction screen was completely occluded with debris. The debris comprised metallic particles and pieces of rubber material consistent with pieces of the rubber magneto drive cushion. The engine crank case halves were separated. The crankshaft was fractured at the rear edge of the number six rod journal and rusted areas were observed on the interior cylinder walls of all six cylinders. So this just isn't something that you can do anything about when you're flying around and one minute the engine is running and the next minute it's not. Over uh, zero Juliet Golf, Roger. Over zero Juliet Golf. If you look to your left, there is a road. Uh, if you need that. Right, here. Over zero Juliet Golf, Roger. Over zero Juliet Golf. Be sure your gear is down. Next gear, I'm good. All right, at this point, he doesn't really have a lot of options, and I'm not sure if the controller was referencing the road that he just flew over, or the interstate, or this one up here, which is where he ends up crashing, but I think the pilot did a great job of not trying to land on the road that he just flew over, because check this out. Some parts of this road just have way too many power lines, and you're probably not gonna see these smaller lines that stretch across the road until it's too late. And the other problem is there's probably way too much traffic on this road, especially as you get closer to the interstate. He's got these big fields on the other side of the interstate, but he's also got these fields over here by the houses. And my guess is that by the time he makes a decision, these fields are closer and they probably look like the better option to him, even though they might be a little small. 
Obviously being able to sit here without the stress of the situation and knowing exactly when the engine is going to quit, we could probably find a solution that would have allowed him to safely land the plane somewhere. So I don't fault him at all for the decision that he made. And I think that he did as best as he could with the hand that he was dealt. But I think that one of the big learning points of this mishap is that if you have engine trouble, you always need to be prepared that at any second your engine can quit. So you wanna to try to pick a good spot to put it down out in front of you until you find a new spot. And you just keep doing that and leapfrogging until you know you can make it to the runway. And don't forget that sometimes the best place to land might be right behind you. And I'm not suggesting that he wasn't doing that. He could have had these fields picked out all along, but you're gonna see a problem with these fields that he probably isn't aware of right now. Now pay attention to his rate of descent and his airspeed, and I'm not sure of the exact timing of the next radio call, but there's not a lot said between the pilot and the controller at this point because the controller is just letting the pilot fly the plane with as little distraction as possible. And even though this is ground speed, you can see it looks like he's already gotten a little bit slow because remember the checklist said to trim for 87 knots, but he's obviously got his hands full and he's doing his best to manage the situation. And he actually ends up needing about 1300 to 1400 feet a minute in his descent just to maintain airspeed. And again, out of respect for his family, I'm gonna cut out his final words, but listen to what the controller tells him to do. And then we'll take a look at the reason why he crashed. Reserve Julia Golf, Roger. We've got our eyes on you, and when you get on the ground, just give us a uh, give us a call on the phone if you can. Sir, you're going to be just fine. You just fly that airplane all the way down, and you'll be fine. And Reserve Julia Golf, you just keep flying that airplane all the way through. You'll be just fine. That was some really good advice from the controller. Just keep flying the plane. Even when you don't have an engine, you just keep flying it all the way down until you land. And that's exactly what this guy did, even though he knew it was going to be tough. Because this is a very critical stage of flight when you don't have an engine and you have to carefully manage your altitude and airspeed. And we'll never know which field he intended to land on. And even though this field might seem like a good option from the aerial imagery, it's actually some sort of new construction site. And if he was aiming for the other field on the south side of the road, the bigger threat that he might not have ever seen because they kind of blend in with the trees are the power lines down here. And unfortunately, he ends up hitting them and the plane comes to rest in the trees across the street where it broke apart and he unfortunately died. Overall, it's a very sad and tragic ending because I think he did the best that he could in the situation he was given. And my heart goes out to his family and friends. And I hope they know that his story is being told so that other pilots can learn more about how to handle situations like this. And I greatly appreciate you watching and I'll see you on the next debrief.